This is not my mother's menopause. This is not my mother's menopause. This is not my mother's menopause. Hi, I'm Laura, your host for the series, This Is Not My Mother's Menopause, what you don't know about menopause, hot flashes, and night sweats. This series is about menopause and how it affects women, especially when symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats start. This is the fifth installment of a six segment series focusing on the diagnosis, treatments, and management of menopause. In the previous segment, we heard from healthcare experts about barriers to care for women in the U.S. when it comes to menopausal symptoms. In this segment, we'll hear from healthcare experts and guests about stigmas and misconceptions associated with menopause. We'll also learn how some of these stigmas can affect women and the people closest to them throughout their menopause transition. Before we hear from our experts and guests, let's first take a look at what menopause is. So what is menopause? A clinical definition of menopause is the natural end of women's menstrual cycles due to a decline in the production of estrogen and progesterone hormones in women. In other words, it's nature's way of ending a woman's monthly menstrual cycle and her ability to get pregnant. You may have heard the terms perimenopause and postmenopause. So what is perimenopause? For most women, perimenopause happens in their 40s, Perimenopause begins several years before menopause. So for many women, this will happen in their 40s, but for some, it can even begin in their 30s. This is the time when ovaries gradually begin to make less estrogen. As estrogen hormones rise and fall, periods grow longer or shorter, and women begin to experience menopause-like symptoms. Menopause naturally occurs in women between the ages of 49 and 52. But the age women experiencing natural menopause can also vary widely from 40 to 58 years old. It also varies by ethnicity. Postmenopause is the time after a woman has been without a menstrual period for 12 months or one full year. During this stage, menopausal symptoms typically decrease or stop completely. The symptoms of menopause usually develop in the transition years. The most common symptoms are vasomotor symptoms, or VMS. Of those surveyed, 40% of women report feeling hot or cold. 17% experience night sweats. 16% say that insomnia is a symptom of menopause. 13% of women experience vaginal dryness. Mood disorders affect 12% of women in menopause. And 12% of women also report weight gain during menopause. In all, 85% of postmenopausal women have experienced a symptom in their lifetime. VMS are the most common symptoms associated with menopause, affecting more than 50% of women ages 40 to 64. The most frequently experienced menopausal symptom among whites, Hispanics, and African Americans were VMS. And among Asians, it was decreased sexual interest and increased joint and muscle discomfort. According to studies, Asian women experience the smallest number of symptoms, and African American women experience the largest number of symptoms compared with other ethnic groups. Of those surveyed, 53% of African American women were more likely than white women, 29%, to have experienced VMS. Factors associated with VMS included race, BMI, and dietary intake of fat and calories. Women's perspective about menopause varies among different countries and ethnicities. Even in this modern era, the practice of sharing myths and stigmas about menopause is still an obstacle when it comes to educating the younger generations about menopause and introducing current science and modern day treatments to women. Although the trend of acknowledging menopause and its symptoms differs among different socioeconomic groups, it still prevails all around the world. In a current study among women of various social classes, those who had the correct information about menopause were mostly from upper class, followed by middle class and then lower class. When it comes to where women get their information about menopause, the most common place is from their relatives, but they also get information from their doctors, friends, and media, like television, radio, or magazines. Some women learned about menopause through more than one source. 
To share her perspective on stigmas and misconceptions associated with menopause is Janet Carpenter. She's a distinguished professor at Indiana University School of Nursing. She's been studying menopause for 25 years. Oh, there are so many stigmas associated with menopause. Um, you know, we, we don't like to age in our society. And so um, menopause is all about aging. And if you look online at anything related to menopause, it's overly negative. Um, you know, the woman has her hand to her head and, and is, you know, ah, oh, I can't stand this in this very dramatic pose. And that's not how we experience menopause as women. Um, because there's a stigma of aging, um, we tend to hide menopause as women. And so uh, when we're in a busy meeting with a lot of different professionals and we have a hot flash, I think we try and hide the fact that we're having a hot flash. You know, we don't take that as a moment to say, oh, I need five seconds here to regroup. I'm having a menopause hot flash. I'll be right with you, right? Instead, we try and hide it, which makes us even more uncomfortable. And then we get embarrassed about it and we think everyone's staring at us. And so, you know, that's some of the stigma that happens. Um, the other stigma that we fight is this notion that hot flashes aren't real or that what women are experiencing at menopause isn't real for them. And there's a long history of um, not really believing or understanding women's experiences. And we need to really pay attention to what women are, are talking about um, and either um, help them manage those symptoms, get relief for them, or at least let them know what the options are in terms of diagnoses or treatments. One of the biggest myths that I deal with is uh, people think there's nothing they can do for their hot flashes, and that's a myth. We have uh, clinical practice guidelines that have been published that review the evidence for what works and what doesn't work for hot flashes. So we know that hormone therapy um, definitely works to alleviate hot flashes and night sweats. Some women are not able to take that because of medical conditions that they may have. And so there's other non-hormonal treatments that are available. They include some medications that are available by prescription. We know that um, antidepressants that affect serotonin and norepinephrine work to um, decrease a woman's hot flashes. Um, they work really quickly. They work within about a week, whereas those medications take about five weeks to work for depression. So we know that they're working perhaps through a different channel or in a different way than they do for depression. And it's important that women understand they're not getting prescribed these medications because as a, as a provider, you might think they're depressed. It's because we know these medications help for hot flashes. There's other medications like gabapentinoids, clonidine, those also work for hot flashes. And then there's some non-medication um, related things that women can do. There's two proven kind of self-help or professionally led programs that women can go through. One program is cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's really been studied by a group out of the United Kingdom. And they've done wonderful research showing that cognitive behavioral therapy can really help a woman's experience of hot flashes. It can help reframe um, how she thinks about hot flashes, and it can help her learn how to better handle and manage her hot flashes in her daily life. A wonderful source for reputable information is menopause.org. It's the website of the North American Menopause Society. There are a ton of resources, both for healthcare providers and women available on that website. And it's the number one site that I recommend to everyone. There are slide sets, there are articles, there are educational programs, um, credentialing programs for healthcare providers. And there's a lot of information that women can download um, from that website. And they're created by menopause practitioners practitioners, menopause professionals. Another thing on that website, menopause.org, is that there are there's a list of books and books that have been reviewed by the North American Menopause Society. So that's a really good place for people to go to see what other resources are available beyond um, those that were produced by the North American Menopause Society. It's important to educate current and younger generations of women so they're better prepared for menopause. But another way to help fight these age-old stigmas and misinformation is to educate a woman's spouse, significant other, and her family and friends so they can be a stronger support system while a woman is going through her menopause transition. It could certainly make for a happier household and work environment if everyone is aware of why a woman is behaving different, is more easily agitated and distracted, and is fighting over the thermostat.
Here Janet shared her thoughts on the importance of educating everyone directly involved with a woman during her menopause transition. We have research showing that partners don't understand menopause. They don't understand there's treatments available for menopausal symptoms like hot flashes, um, and they don't know what to do for their partners. And so um, understanding a woman's experience is important. So not dismissing those symptoms, um, really giving it their full attention, paying attention, listening to what a woman has to say, seeing if they need any help troubleshooting. Have they talked to a healthcare provider about what's happening in their body? Um, has that healthcare provider been helpful or not? Is it time to maybe find a different healthcare provider? So helping walk them through some of that troubleshooting that may need to happen with the healthcare system can be really important. And then also, I think, I think one of the biggest things we see, and, and it seems so minor, but it's this fighting that we do over the thermostat. Uh, the menopausal woman wants the house to be between 60 and 65 degrees. And, you know, everyone else in the house might be really comfortable at 70 degrees. And there needs to be an understanding of we've got to meet somewhere in the middle. As a menopausal woman, it is very uncomfortable to be in a warm space. You can only take off so many clothes um, to become comfortable. Um, the other thing that happens with menopausal women is they become chilled really quickly. And so they go from like too warm to too cold sometimes, and so they're never really very comfortable. And I think not making jokes about that is important. You know, oh, there goes mom again, right? And everybody rolls their eyes. It, let's not do that. Um, let's understand, oh gosh, you know, mom's having a hot flash. Um, what can we do to help her, right? It's a different attitude uh, that I think we need to take towards menopausal women. And women themselves, I think, need to be more open to talking about their experiences. We talked about women in a boardroom, you know, kind of hiding the fact that they're having a menopausal symptom when really it's a moment that we can educate people about what we're going through. And I think we need to grab those and really use them and talk with people so that we can get the support that we need as women. Our next guest, Edwidge Thomas, is 60 years old and is a nurse practitioner who lives and practices in New York City. She was born in Haiti and raised and educated in the U.S. Edwidge shared her personal observations about the importance of spouses, partners, and significant others learning about the facts of menopause. She says supporting a woman throughout her menopause transition is a true partnership. Typically, we don't talk about the male partners and some of the journey that they're going through um, as it relates to menopause. I mean, you think about the hot flashes and, you know, the mood swings and the, you know, the brain fog, um, you know, the, the anxiety. Uh, all of that has an impact on, you know, partners as it relates to the hot flashes and, you know, the need to, to decrease the temperature in the bedroom, the need to have that fan, the need to have the lower uh, the, the different type of um, bedding, uh, you know, you can always, you know, pack on more blankets for yourself, even though the, the, the temperature in the room is cold, but just keep in mind that that sleep disturbance that uh, women go through during menopause really affects their entire, uh, entire day uh, to the point where it even it affects their eating habits, it affects their mood for work and their ability to be productive. So I urge my, my, my male uh, counterparts out there, my male friends and colleagues, and all of you who are males out there, that you know you have a spouse that's going through, or a partner going through menopause, um, I, I urge you to, um, to read about it and understand what those, some of those symptoms are. Our next guest, Joyce Moy, is an Asian American Pacific Islander and a resident of Hawaii. Joyce is 75 years old and is retired Sadly, Joyce suffered 13 miscarriages early in her reproductive years, likely due to endometriosis, and she has no children. She had an emergency hysterectomy at the age of 36 that caused her to go into early menopause. Having started menopause so young, Joyce didn't really have any family or friends who could relate to what she was dealing with at the time. Luckily, Joyce's family and friends stood by her as they were learning about her experiences. Based on her unique experiences, Joyce says women should get their information on the symptoms and treatments related to menopause directly from their healthcare providers. I feel that the younger generation right now 
regardless of where you live, they're a little bit more knowledgeable because the parents are a little bit more open. If you go to the old country back in China, to the countryside, they have no clue as to what's happening. And you still don't talk about it. It's taboo. It's a dirty subject, you know, or, or else the parents don't even care. They just push it aside. So it's, it's difficult. If you're in a modern city, then they're more open and free to talk about it because they're more educated about it. When my friends started going through menopause, I didn't have a lot of information to give them to them because, like I said, I was taught by my mother, you know, don't listen to, to other people. And so since my situation was different, I didn't dare give them any opinion as to what might happen to them or, you know, what they should do. Uh, the only thing I ever told them was, talk to your doctor, your doctor, or even your nurse. They should be able to give you more information because I may lead you down the wrong way and you can end up harming yourself. So that and that's how I took it. Unfortunately, women throughout the U.S. don't always seek treatment for their menopause symptoms because they're too embarrassed to discuss their symptoms with a health care provider, especially if that provider is a man. Our next guest is Dr. Tchaikovsky. His parents are from Macedonia, and his passion for medicine and serving others comes from his family roots. He has ancestors on both sides of his family that were village doctors. He lives and practices in Hawaii. He says some women are often ashamed to discuss their menopause symptoms because of their cultural teachings. They may not realize that ignoring their symptoms can lead to more severe medical issues. Well, I think some cultures more than others are very embarrassed or they're ashamed to talk about certain things. That's bad because that could lead to them not getting the care they need. You know, For example, some women are afraid even to talk about having a UTI. I've had specifically uh, some Japanese women, you know, think that UTI is associated with being bad and uh, they don't want to bring it up or they don't want to bring it up on time. And a lot of them then can suffer and end up going from a urinary tract infection to an upper kidney infection, which we call pyelonephritis, which then they'll have to be hospitalized. And then, of course, there's a lot of, you know, shame and, and uh, worry if somebody's had, you know, either an extramarital affair or they're younger and they're you know, having a, you know, a you know, passionate love life and uh, they get an STD. Some women just sometimes just don't know or they ignore the symptoms because they're ashamed to talk about it and let somebody know. Some women are even shamed or don't know how to talk about the, the changes they're going through when they're, when they're going through menopause because they've never had like maybe a role model like a grandmother or a mother to tell them, hey, you know, this is gonna happen when you get older, don't worry, you can go see the doctor, you know. So, yeah, there's always going to be issues related to many illnesses that you know women are ashamed or afraid to talk about. And I think uh, access to care is also the issue due to the fact that if you can't if you can't talk to your mother or some friend about it, you know they, they don't have any medical background. You need to talk to a professional. I'd like to see a way that um, all populations could you know focus on their health. And I think from the women perspective, you know if there are some shame or there's some you know, bashfulness or what have you about certain healthcare symptoms or healthcare worries that they have, they should try to overcome them. But maybe there's something that we can do to make it more easier for people to understand that there's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, maybe we can focus on education or focus on somehow uh, public service announcements or something that make people more comfortable, make them understand that they're not alone, they're not the only ones going through these kind of problems. And then seek, you know, medical advice, get medical care. We've spent this segment learning from our experts and guests about the impact of the stigmas and misconceptions related to menopause. Also about the importance of education and support as women go through their menopause transition. In the last segment of this series, we'll examine treatments and therapies relating to menopause. When it comes to understanding this transition in a woman's life, our goal is to help our audience have a better understanding of what menopause is 
and to help women make better choices when it comes to the management of their symptoms and overall physical and behavioral health throughout this stage in their lives. Please join me for the next segment in this series. We'll see you soon.